Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to another edition of Orthopaedic Specialist um, Educational uh, Evening. Um, it's um, great to have you guys joining us once again, and it's a real pleasure to be um, introducing my friends and colleagues uh, to tonight's talk. Um, so we're, today we're going to be looking at pec major and triceps injuries, and we've got our world-class faculty of Mr. Ali Narani, Professor Roger Van Reet, and Mr. Jagwant Singh. My name is Ragbir Kakar and I uh, look after the edu educational program for orthopedic specialists. And we're just going to take you through uh, these topics today. Um, as a starter, um, it always fills me with joy when I look at this slide and I'm constantly updating it. We're expanding as a group, um, including world-class physicians, surgeons uh, to join the group and provide um, MSK healthcare, whether that's related to uh, limb and joint pathologies through to maxillofacial pain management, rheumatological conditions and plastic surgery. Uh, we have a whole host of surgeons that uh, come from um, both the UK and, and abroad. Um, and uh, Professor Van Riet um, is one of our surgeons uh, who, who travels in and um, looks after our patients. We do our, uh, a lot of our day case and consultation work out of the Harley Street Specialist Hospital. Uh, this is a building which is uh, located on Queen Anne Street. Um, it's recently been refurbished to have um, fantastic state-of-the-art theatres and our clinic spaces have also recently been uh, refurbished. Um, it's, it's, it's our home and we love working out of there. For our more major cases, uh, we work together with our partners at the London Clinic who always support us with these educational events and um, we're very lucky to be working out of the largest uh, private institution in London. Um, and with these uh, world class facilities combined, we're able to do uh, the procedures that are required. So Mr. Ali Nurani um, requires no introduction. Um, he's the co-founder of Orthopaedic Specialists at Harley Street Specialist Hospital. I work very closely with him. He's a leading upper limb surgeon at uh, the uh, Royal London Hospital, which is one of the, um, which is Europe's largest trauma center. So he's very familiar with um, dealing with complex um, fractures and um, complex limb pathology. Um, he's widely uh, published in upper limb sports conditions, and he's going to be uh, talking tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Roger Van Riet is, um, uh, is truly a world renowned shoulder and elbow surgeon. Um, the word pioneer is often overused to describe surgeons, but he truly is. Um, when it comes to um, arthroscopic elbow surgery, and it's not unusual for him to be treating international uh, athletes in both the Olympic and world uh, disciplines. Um, he is heavily published and uh, was the first president of the Belgian Shoulder and Elbow Society. Uh, Mr. Jagwan Singh, um, he's, uh, he's, one, he's a, co a contemporary of mine um, who is also one of our upper limb surgeons. Um, he's a real um, adv advocate for cutting edge techniques in both arthroscopic and joint replacement surgery. He's incredibly well trained, um, having done a prestigious fellowships around Wrightington and having achieved the award uh, from the British Elbow Society. He was able to go to the Stedman Clinic, Harvard Shoulder Unit and the Mayo Clinic, and he was awarded the Charlie Gold Medal. So we're really lucky to have him as part of our team. Um, myself, I'm a knee surgeon. I look after the educational program and um, I work at my NHS practices out of Guys and St. Thomas's. And I've got a keen interest in joint preservation and sports injuries around the knee. So, more importantly, we're going to talk, we're going to, these are the topics we're going to be looking at today. Um, so, um, Roger's going to, looking, we're going to be looking at triceps ruptures, uh, acute repairs, chronic reconstruction with tendon grafts and post-op rehabilitation. Um, Ali's gonna then go into uh, PEC major injuries, uh, when to uh, reconstruct and when to, do, perform, to offer non-operative uh, treatment. And a key question we, uh, that often gets asked is a uh, rehabilitation around these complex problems. As you know, we, we regularly have an educational program. Um, the next one scheduled is a few weeks away, but there, it's likely there'll be one in between, which we will let you know about via LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, but myself and Professor Wilson are going to be talking about the updates and contemporary management of uh, knee, knee uh, pain. And for all of our webinars that we do, we offer two CPD points um, following 
um, which will be awarded once you've completed your questionnaire. We've got um, various uh, social media platforms using LinkedIn and Twitter. Feel free to follow us on all of these platforms where we update you on all the um, our educational programs that we're going to be running, as well as treatments that we've been offering and um, the, uh, the views from a patient's perspective are often also published on these platforms. If you would like to refer a patient in or for, for help with the patient, do not hesitate to get in touch. And our details are at the bottom of the screen. I'm now going to hand over to Mr. Jagwan Singh, who's going to be um, looking at, uh, who's going to be moderating the session. Uh, Mr. Jagwan Singh, over to you. Hi, thank you, Rags, for the lovely introduction. Uh, so our first speaker tonight will be Professor Roger Van Reed. He's based at Antwerp, where he's uh, treats about 900 elbow cases a day uh, in a year. And this by far is the maximum number um, by any elbow surgeon in the world. He has pioneered numerous elbow open surgical as well as um, arthroscopic procedures, including techniques on triceps tendon repair, which uh, most of the elbow surgeons follow in their surgical practice. He um, has written extensively about more than 100 papers, 50 book chapters. He dedicates a lot of his time for, treat, uh, for training young elbow surgeons. He runs his own fellowship, his own elbow course. Normally in pre-COVID times, he would be traveling all around the world, but currently he's sitting in his place and doing webinars in different time zones. Um, he is, he's been former president of the uh, Belgian Elbow Society and sits on the executive committee of the European Children Elbow Society. So without wasting any time, we're, we are kind of gearing up to hear his experiences on triceps, where he treats lots of um, ace uh, sports persons. So over to Roger. Can I share, uh, share my screen? Uh, yes, please do, yeah. Yeah, the host, the host needs to, uh, please to give me permission. Is Rags the host? Jags, you must be the host right now. Well. Okay, just let me check, share screen. All panelists, okay, it's done. Um, I'm trying again. Yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jack, that was a, uh, by far the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. 900 surgeries a day, that'd be great. Um, so Thank triceps you. stairs. Um, I'm a consultant with Acumet. I'm a designer of uh, this uh, temporary mobilizer by uh, Jake Design. And uh, let's talk about triceps. So as you know, triceps, three heads. Um, we know that we have a lateral head, a long head, and then the medial head. But the medial head is mainly deep to both uh, other, uh, other triceps heads. They attach to the tendon proper, and there's a very strong lateral expansion and a, a less strong medial expansion um, next to this tendon. The width of the actual tendon is two and a half, uh, approximately two and a half to three centimeters, uh, as you can see here in this uh, in this picture. Um, it inserts on the tip of the olecranon, on the back of the olecranon, with a footprint of about 466 square millimeters, as you can see here. Uh, this is the medial head. Um, the medial head is mainly muscular, so the muscular it has a muscular insertion. It uh, inserts a little bit on the tendon proper, but less than the other two heads. Ruptures are quite rare, are very rare, less than 1% of upper extremity tendon problems, and mainly uh, avulsions from bone. <clears throat> Etiology includes a fall, direct trauma, obviously, motor vehicle accidents, and unfortunately, surgery is not uncommon. Following uh, osteosynthesis, maybe following a bursectomy or following total elbow replacement. And in some series up to 10% up to have um, triceps tendon problems following a, an elbow replacement. And then finally, low energy trauma can, uh, um, can occur as well if there are comorbidities such as chronic renal failure, local steroid injections, so diabetes, wheelchair uh, transfer. So patients in a wheelchair are likely, more likely to have a, um, a triceps tendon rupture because they're using their arms for legs, obviously. And then finally, that's the big one, I think, uh, anabolic, anabolic steroid use in, uh, in uh, some athletes. Not surprisingly, the male to female ratio is six to one, average age about 45 years old in these patients who have abused their, uh, their triceps tendon over the years. 
this is surprisingly, it's easily missed. And in the paper that we wrote a long time ago now, um, uh, this is a series from uh, Mayo Clinic. It was misdiagnosed in 45%. So in 45%, the initial diagnosis of a, a tricepsinal rupture was missed, which is huge. And it shouldn't be missed. There's, a, there's swelling, there's an ecchymosis maybe, uh, although sometimes the bruise is uh, more uh, prominent the day after. Uh, there's pain, patients all have pain. There's always, almost always a palpable gap um, if you know where to, what to look for. So what you should look for is you palpate the tricep tendon both in a relaxed state and in an extended state. And if you're not quite sure, uh, make sure that you look at the other side as well and, and palpate it there, or maybe add some flexion or extension. Um, and when in doubt, get some, uh, get some imaging. There's decreased range of motion up to 30 degrees extension lag and less weakness, although act active extension may still be possible because uh, very often the medial head, which is mostly muscular, uh, may not be uh, ruptured. And the lateral expansion is, is uh, very rarely ruptured. So uh, uh, some, uh, some of the extension mechanism will still be intact. This is a patient, um, there you go. So he ruptured his tendon, it's actually a chronic rupture. He's able to extend, but he's not able to uh, eccentrically um, load his tricep center. So it's, it's, I actually made him do it 10 times, but I thought for the video, it was a little bit less, but it, that was a complete tricep tendon rupture. So on clinical exam, this is a triad. Triceps weakness, all have triceps weakness, all of them. May still be able to, uh, to do active extension, but they'll all have uh, triceps weakness. But this is a specific because it might be because of pain, for example. 80% uh, in, uh, in our series had a palpable gap and decreased active extension with an average 30 degree lag. So they were able to extend, but on average, they weren't able to fully extend. Radiographic findings, uh, even on, on an x-ray like this, it might be missed because your eyes are drawn to the, um, to the radial shaft fracture. But obviously when you look a little bit closer, you see um, some bone flakes at the back and this is pathognomonic for a uh, tricep tendon rupture. So this is definitely a tricep tendon rupture um, diagnosed from x-ray. <clears throat> Ultrasound, if you're not sure, we know it's, it's um, user dependent or operator dependent. Uh, but an ultrasound should be a, a, a normal ultrasonographer should be able to grab uh, a two uh, to find a tricep tendon tear. And then if you're still not sure, uh, you can get an MRI, but this often uh, leads to um, delay in repair. So uh, we try to avoid MRIs if we can. Treatment and surgery, unless uh, the patient is medically unfit, unless the patient is very, very low demand, uh, we tend to uh, just repair these, uh, these tricep tendons um, at, at least as soon as we can. Primary repair is preferred, and I left away the timing because uh, I've had, uh, actually today I did a tricep tendon tear, which was six months old, and I was still able to uh, repair it back to bone. So if we can um, repair it back to bone, that's the preferred treatment. If not, we might be able to, uh, or you might need to use a, a tendon graft. Well, logically, an, uh, an acute repair or an acute rupture, uh, a primary repair is easier. So if you get them soon, operate on them soon. There's no, there's no point in waiting on these. This was a professional cyclist who had a, a lacrinon uh, fracture earlier. You can see the, the, the wire still on the lacrinon, the, the cable. And as you can see, part of the uh, medial head is still attached. And uh, this is a complete uh, tricep tendon rupture. In chronic cases, we're not sure. So uh, like I said, I, I was able to uh, repair one today, but that's sort of a guess. We, don't, we, know, we never know until you go, get into the case and I told the patient I was uh, very likely going to use a, a graft and then decided uh, during surgery it wasn't necessary and I would prefer not to use a graft for the obvious reasons, first of all, because it decreases risk of infection. You don't have any foreign bodies in the, or not that many, that not that much foreign uh, material in the, uh, in the body. The results are very similar. Um, primary repair a little bit better. Isokinetic strength after two years is 90%. Isokinetic work 100%, so they do very well. Range of motion might be a little bit decreased uh, compared to the other side. Whereas in reconstructions, um, isokinetic strength uh, um, quite a bit less than, uh, than in the uh, repair group. So if we can use their own body uh, tissue, then I think that's preferred. <clears throat> this was a patient who uh, fell on a, uh, on a tram line actually, had an open tricep tendon rupture. That's why we have such a funky uh, incision. You can see repair it back to bone. There's still a piece of uh, tendon attached. And um, this is that patient. Oh, I think, oh, I thought I, sorry, I thought I had a post-op with him. Uh, six weeks post-op um, actually was doing very well. 
This is a subacute tear. I think at this point it was three months old. Um, we still uh, treat it as a um, as an acute tear. It's a 57 year old um, bodybuilder still. <clears throat> Did abuse some uh, some substance, substances. I, I I devised a little trick. It's a little, it's a little bit sneaky, but I tell the patients that uh, you know I ask them if they use or abuse uh, any steroids or any growth hormone or any uh, insulin. Some of them use insulin, um, and they all say no, no. I'm the only clean bodybuilder in the world. And then I tell them, listen, that no worries. I'm not asking for uh, to blame you or to put any shame on you. But uh, if you get a general anesthesia. Uh, you might die from the from the consequences because you've been mixing the medication, and then most of them still say, "Well, well, no, I did use uh, something a few weeks ago, but uh, I'm clean now." So it's a little trick. I'm not I'm not proud of the trick, but it does help because if you know that a patient has been using or abusing a substance, they're likely to uh, go back to the gym very very quickly. They don't they will not listen to your post op rehab plan at all. So um, those patients I tend to immobilize a little bit longer. So we often do a um, hybrid repair, as you can see. So one of the main things that you saw earlier in this video is you need to debride. Debride all the tissue that, um, that looks like scar tissue because it's no use repairing scar tissue to bone. It's not gonna hold, um, your, your repair is just gonna be awful and the, the result's gonna be awful as well. And secondly, if you can get the, the native tendon back to the bone, you're more or less restoring uh, length. And um, um, well, this is a 57 year old person, but if you have a a true bodybuilder who still wants to compete, they need symmetry. So uh, if you can restore them back to length with the symmetrical uh, left and right bicep, uh, triceps, these patients are much happier. <clears throat> so as you can see, despite the fact that this was a, an older rupture, we were able to get it back to bone. So some of you viewers looking at, uh, at where is the ulnar nerve. I know exactly where the ulnar nerve is uh, during surgery, but I don't necessarily um, uh, release it. This is an important one. You test the tension-free tension range of flexion. That's very important because that is the, the only guide for rehab. If we get a tension-free flexion range of not more than 90 degrees, I let them go. I tell them, listen, just move, be careful with it, but you mobilize the, uh, the arm immediately. Um, like I said, do we immobilize? No unless there is tension during that range. So if it's less than 90 degrees, we do immobilize them. Um, if necessary, we do use a dynamic brace with uh, flexion restriction. And if so, uh, we do a 30 degrees extra, we, we allow 30 degrees extra for every two weeks and full flexion is always allowed at about six weeks. There's a little trick in those uh, athletes that you think are not gonna listen to you. You can just use a, a vicral or resorbable suture that's not very strong and uh, add this to your repair. So what you do then is you make you repair the, the tendon back to bone, do everything correctly, and then just put a little loop in the tendon that's a little bit too tight uh, onto the uh, proximal ulna. And then uh, patients that are a little bit nasty or a little, you know, they're not listening to you, um, they will rupture that little tendon or that little suture very quickly. After a week or two, they'll rupture it. They'll be very scared because they, uh, they think the triceps is ruptured. They'll come back in, we'll tell them this, no, the triceps looks good, so uh, be very careful. And uh, they tend to be uh, uh, scared into listening to the rehab program. That's a trick I learned from uh, from uh, Barry Savoir from uh, <clears throat> from New Orleans, who treats lots of these American football players. Uh, this is the patient uh, six weeks post-op, the guy who fell and um, and had an open triceps tendon rupture. This is six weeks. He's able to, um, to extend against gravity. And as you can see, he's able to hold his hand as well. It's not dropping down. He's not interested in resistance training, but if we do have a patient that's interesting, interested in resistance training, we allow them to do that after three months. I do tell them because they, those guys want to go back to the gym as quickly as possible. I do tell them they're allowed to go back to the gym, train their biceps, train their legs, train their pecs, uh, but just don't do any push-ups and don't do any triceps exercises. And, and most of them are pretty, uh, pretty good. When do we do a reconstruction? So when do we think that the uh, that the elbow that the triceps is, is uh, the tendon is too poor or too retracted to return back to, to its base? Um, like I said, we we plan for it, but we always it's always a pair of decision. So this is a triceps tendon that looks very uh, poor. This is all scar tissue all the way up to my uh, all the way up, to, up to, to the proximal part of my incision. So we're sort of sure when we debride this, is this going to need a a a, um, a graft? And we have one available, but still not using it until I'm 100% sure it's not going down. <clears throat> so 
So this is after debridement. You see, I do a very, very thorough debridement because I truly believe that it's no use to, uh, to suture um, that scar tissue uh, back to the bone. You can also see that muscle belly of the, of the medial head, which is still attached. This is an example, you see a big arm. We don't use a tourniquet, so the, uh, the video is not uh, that nice. It becomes a little bit red after a while. Uh, we don't use a tourniquet for obvious reasons, um, because if, you, if you're pulling on that triceps tendon and the tourniquet is holding it, then obviously you can't, uh, you can't pull it all the way down. In um, those retracted cases, I do find the ulnar nerve and I mark it. So I'm sure that the ulnar nerve, first of all, that I, I know where the ulnar nerve is. And secondly, um, I, I know that it's not gonna end up in my repair. <clears throat> so again, big, uh, a big dissection, all the scar tissue is gone. Notice that on the lateral side, the lateral expansion is still intact. It, it, it almost always is. Uh, we then debride the back of the, uh, of the electronon to make sure there's a bleeding surface. And this is the, uh, this is the graft. This is an Achilles tendon graft. Um, obviously it's a, uh, an allo graft, it's not an outro graft. Um, we have to order these. I'm not sure what your situation is, but we have to order these in. And then uh, they're in the freezer, ready to use. So we do two diagonal um, uh, bone bridges and one uh, transverse in this case. Um, patients really do not like any uh, knots at the uh, distal end of the, uh, of the elbow. So we try to avoid that. The transverse um, tunnel that you saw is not always necessary, but in these patients, in the, in the bodybuilders that are really, really uh, body conscious, I try to bury, the, bury all the sutures. So then it becomes a little bit of a crochet uh, exercise. Uh, pull the tendon down as far as you can. Even if you, if you know you can't reach, pull the tendon down as far as you can. Um, my assistant has a very, uh, uh, no, not a very nice job now because uh, he or she has to pull, has to keep the elbow in extension throughout this case. Obviously in extension, the, cord, the electron is closer to the triceps tendon than the inflection. You see, we're, we're almost getting there. It's not too bad. Um, but then when we test the, uh, the, the tension on this, it's huge. So uh, this will rupture very, very quickly, immediate, or almost immediately after the, after the patient will start moving. So in this case, uh, especially also, see it's opening again with flexion, especially because he's a very high demand patient, we decided to, uh, to use a graft. If I'm correct, then this, this patient had this, uh, had this uh, tricep structure for, uh, I think it was three or four years before he, uh, before he uh, asked for, uh, for surgery. So a little bit of side to side, so we don't have a big gap. And then, the, um, and then this is the, uh, the Achilles tendon. Always order the Achilles tendon with a bit of calcaneus on it. Um, sometimes you need the calcaneus and I'll show you, I'll show you in the next video, uh, but it helps a lot because the tendon itself is quite slippery. And holding on to the calcaneus actually prevents the tendon from uh, from falling on the floor, and it's it's helped me quite often. <clears throat> so a very nice slim tendon, uh, the the Achilles tendon is a beautiful tendon, and it uh, it fits like a glove over the uh, over the over the triceps tendon. It's actually a little bit wider than the triceps. We tend to do a three or four uh, row repair to make sure there's no dead space under the triceps, and then if you have a small uh, patient and a big Achilles tendon you can actually um, fold it back up to itself, uh, onto itself and suture that as well to make the repair even stronger. So if you do 900 elbow surgeries a day, like uh, Jack said, you need to have, you need to have this speed. Um, and that works, that works nicely for me. Again, tension, be, tension free range. Obviously, there's a lot of tension on it. I'm pushing him quite hard, but you can see the muscle belly coming down, and that's what these uh, these uh, bodybuilders want. They want symmetry. I think I think some of them would prefer for me to cut the other side uh, as long as it's symmetrical. So this is a totally totally different patient. This is a patient, as you can see, has had lots of surgeries, ended up with a total elbow replacement, um, has no proximal ulna, and has no uh, triceps uh, function at all. I'm sorry for the poor visibility here, but a posterior incision, find and protect the other nerve, especially with uh, following a, um, total L replacement, because I don't know what the previous surgeon did with this, uh, uh, with this, um, with the nerve when he was doing the, re the revision. 
sorry for the bloody image, but very clearly a different animal than the, than the previous patient. Um, the, the tendon, oh, sorry, even, even the muscle doesn't look that good. Here's the, uh, the prosthesis in plain view. So we need to cover that. That's basically what we're doing now. But as you can see now, when we're flexing the elbow, there's no triceps function. So despite the fact that we, uh, that we repaired the gap, there's no triceps function. So that's what I was, the point I was making earlier. If you're trying to repair the triceps with scar tissue, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna, it's not gonna mobilize like they, would, like they would want to. There's the Achilles tendon with the bone block. <clears throat> and what we do then is we shape the bone block. Like I said, this patient didn't have a proximal ulna. And um, um, so we need something to attach the triceps tendon to. This takes a long, long time. Uh, to shape it well, because if you make this too bulky, it's going to be very painful for the patient and, you, and you're basically waiting for skin problems. So uh, we end up with uh, quite a small sliver of bone and that fits, that has to fit perfectly over the proximal ulna. You can use circlash wires, you can use um, um, non absorbable type suture if you want. Uh, I prefer not to use screws, especially when there's no prosthesis, when the prosthesis is in there. Uh, so we prefer to circleize this. I think there's no uh, no best way of doing this. Uh, sometimes we use two, like in this case, but you can use three as well. And um, sometimes it's helpful to use one circleize wire proximal to the bone fragment, so where the bone doesn't doesn't actually slip. Because in this way, it could potentially still slip. But if you if you put one on the tendon um, past the bone um, past the bone graft then it will not slip. Well, this is the same as before. Uh, in this case, we doubled the graft, so small per person, big graft. We doubled the graft um, for, the, for obvious reasons, but also to have some more coverage of the prosthesis. Central, medial, and lateral row. The central row to, uh, to avoid dead space. And then you test the reconstruction, and you see how now we have, uh, we have uh, motion in the, in the muscle belly as well. And this is post-op and she actually healed quite well. I think this is now, it's an older video. I think she's, she's now five or six years, uh, five or six years past the tricep tendon reconstruction. There's no date on the x-ray, but uh, I think that's about it. Post-operatively, immediate mobilization depends on the tension free range. It's exactly the same as the acute uh, ruptures or the acute repairs. If necessary, flexion restriction. And uh, in general, in those uh, reconstructions I do, restrict the flexion. So they, they wake up from surgery with their arm extended in a plaster. The day after they get a dynamic brace, um, usually they're allowed to, uh, about 60 degrees of flexion in the first, in the first uh, two weeks and then 30 degrees more every two weeks. Full flexion after, two, after six weeks. Um, surprisingly, we don't, we don't see uh, any, any contractions in these patients. They, uh, the triceps muscle tends to be very flexible after a while. And even when they're a little bit slow with the rehab, they, uh, they, they tend to regain motion very, very easily. The bodybuilders, the flexion is a little bit less, pro less, uh, less of a problem because they're big biceps. So they're, they're not able to flex anyway, but, but even in the, in, the older, in the elderly lady with the triceps um, reconstruction, they, uh, they regain full flexion quite quickly. So again, active for extension after uh, three weeks, uh, against gravity after three weeks, uh, and resistance training at three months. So in conclusion, um, we do prefer a primary repair. Unfortunately, tendon grafting is sometimes necessary, but like I said, it's a decision to be made during surgery, not before, during surgery. However, you need to be ready for it. If, you, um, if during surgery you find that you can't get it back down, but you don't have a, a graft in the freezer, then, uh, then you have a problem. And then very good results are, um, are usually um, I usually found after a year or two. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That was amazing presentation, especially the, um, the problem you mentioned about the triceps failure in total elbow replacement. Um, I mean, as you see a lot of these cases, is there a specific approach you've noticed that that leads to this problem more vis-a-vis -vis the triceps sparing approaches? Yes, unfortunately, the, um, you know, I love uh, Dr. Mori, but unfortunately the Brian Mori approach leads to uh, triceps tendon problems in, in many patients. And um, uh, not because, I don't think that's because of the, uh, the, the approach. I think it's because of the repair. If you're not a, if you're not a very experienced uh, 
total album replacement surgeon, then um, we know the complications are fast. You know, in, in the UK, I think they did a good job in trying to avoid these by uh, allocating them to uh, specialist centers. But um, so you're doing a difficult surgery, you make sure that your that your that your um, prosthesis is in the right spot. You're very happy that you didn't kill the nerve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you need to take half an hour to 45 minutes to repair the triceps. Mm -hmm. And if you rush that, that's a problem. Um, we tend to do the triceps. We tend to do the the total elbow replacements now with triceps on, even the revisions. Um, uh, we use a lateral paras tricipital approach that was uh, described by Graham King, and uh, that works quite well. And so far, we don't see any. We haven't seen any tricep tendon problems. But when I see them from uh, well, from elsewhere, then uh, almost always they've they've used the Brian Murray approach. Great, thank you, Roger. We'll move on to our next speaker who is Ali Nurani. He sees lots of um, shoulder injuries in his practice at Royal London and also the tertiary practice at orthopedic specialists. His association with NBA, NFL and Rugby World has given him opportunity to treat these elite sports person. So over to Ali for uh, PAC major injuries. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, I hope you can all hear me clearly. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, PAC majors uh, injuries. Now, for, for most shoulder surgeons, this is a relatively rare injury. Um, but in my practice, where I work at the Royal London, I start seeing quite a few of them. So Royal London, as we informed you guys, uh, Europe's biggest trauma center, but it's also in that part of the London where there is a younger population, population that does a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of sporty population as well. Unfortunately, a lot of steroid use as well in those same populations. So we, I start seeing a lot of pec major ruptures uh, in that population. And then following that with the association with uh, elite sports, especially a very steady following of uh, UFC and heavy weightlifters. Once you treat one or two of them, then the rest seem to come to you as well. So um, just like Roger as a... Um, elbow surgeon sees disproportionately huge number of triceps rupture, I probably see quite a few more pec major ruptures compared to most people. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of patients. And the first one is a 32-year-old right-handed professional footballer who came to see me about five days after an injury. Um, and he was complaining of pain in his right shoulder chest. It's very nonspecific. Um, he had come with an MRI scan, but the MRI scan wasn't done, was high enough, so I didn't see the pec, so I initially missed it. Um, but the best thing about professional athletes, in fact, a lot of times about even non-professional athletes nowadays is there's always a camera around, right? So instead of asking the patient exactly what happened, uh, sometimes we have an opportunity to actually look at what happened. So you'll see this guy running in blue, uh, and then suddenly he falls. It happens very, very quickly. And you can see him holding his um, shoulder when he injured himself. Now, it's very hard to tell, even if you slow it down, what happened to his arm. Did he fall on it? Did he dislocate it, etc.? But it's hard to tell. Um, so obviously, he came in, we assessed him. And something that we noticed pretty clearly was some of the telltale signs of a pec major injury. So he had some swelling and bruising in the axilla, right? So there's blood, something is torn, something is ripped out. There was a slight asymmetry in the axillary fold when his arm is in the aber position, i.e. abducted and external rotated. Similarly, there was a little bit of tenderness, not much, at the anteriorly at the pec major insertion on the proximal humerus. Now in his case, we didn't see a drop nipple sign, which is one of the uh, signs that you get with a complete uh, pec major rupture. Neither did we see bunching of the pec major. So clinically, the suspicion was that are the two heads, right? It was very likely that the sternal head had gone and the clavicular head was intact. So as you will know with some of the anatomy, the pec major is a large muscle, massive muscle. Okay, and it has different origins. Significant proportion of it comes from the sternum and a significant proportion of the other head comes from the clavicle. 
and it kind of merges together and twists around. And what ends up happening is that the clavicular head inserts in the humerus and the sternal head inserts slightly behind it. And I'll show you a few of the diagrams later on. Pec major is a muscle of vanity. So this is Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, with his arm in the able position. And what you can see is in bodybuilders that the pec major creates a lovely anterior axillary fold. So in addition to symptoms of pain, etc., when somebody spends their life in the gym and building up these muscles, if they suddenly don't have this symmetry, they tend to hate it. A bit more about the anatomy. So there's a clavicular head, which is the in the uh, label C, the sternal head label, label the S. And what you can see is that the insertion, two things. First of all, it inserts just lateral to the biceptal groove. And more interestingly, the clavicular head is insertion is slightly more superficial compared to the sternal head. The sternal head inserts right behind it. On the diagram on the right-hand side, you'll see the brachial plexus and the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves that seem to provide the, provide the nerve innovation to the muscles. When you have a full rupture of both the heads, it's pretty clear. You will probably have the bunching of the muscles when you contract it. You will have the drop nipple sign. But a lot of the times you get what we see in the smaller circle at the bottom, i.e. the clavicular head has not torn but only the sternal head is torn. So this wasn't this guy, but this is a guy who would have both heads gone. So you see that typical bruising in the axilla in the armpit. You also see on the right-hand side, the nipple being dropped. And you also see that when they do a Superman pose with the hands on the hips, that on the left-hand side here, you lost the axillary fold where the right side is intact. These are obvious signs, but sometimes they're not as clear cut as this. So how do you injure a pec major? Well, most of them are indirect injuries, but some of them could be direct injuries. So you could have a direct hit on the muscle hard enough that you tear it. But the real mechanism of the majority of them is indirect, i.e. You have a rapid extension, abduction, external rotation position, and you're doing a maximum eccentric contraction like that. Imagine a guy on the bench with his arms out there lifting really, really heavy weights. So the muscle is stretching, but you're also contracting it and then it can tear. So it tends to be obviously mostly young men. Usually I see them in bench pressing, but they come from different fields, but you see a bench pressing injury. There's often, unfortunately, a history of anabolic steroids as well. And I think that is may not be just one injury, but there's a lot of micro trauma that builds up that eventually results in the muscle tearing out. There's only one really classification out there. Is it really helpful? But it is because Quite simply, when the muscle is torn at the muscle origin, which is rare as anything, or muscle belly, is, is hard to fix it. You can't stitch pieces of steak together. But quite often what happens is that the, the muscle either tears clean off the bone, uh, sorry, the tendon tears clean off the bone, or you have an intra-tendinous injury, or you tear um, at the muscle tendon junction. And all of these, in the right patients are operative cases. Very rarely, if the muscle tendon is strong and the bone isn't strong, this is quite rare, that you actually may avulse the tendon with a piece of bone as well. Just like you saw Roger pre present in the triceps. When the triceps ruptures often has a piece of bones in it. That is very rare to have it in the pec major because usually the weakest link is actually at the level of the tendon. So the tendon either tears off the bone, tears within the tendon, or tears at the muscle tendon junction. So the three pictures in the middle are the common scenario. 
So this guy, professional footballer, had normal x-rays, right? We just want to make sure there's no bony injury. Now I'll just run through the MRI scan. These are axial scans of his MRI scan. If I just pause it there, you will see that here is his biceps tendon. Lots of fluid around it. And what you see here is just the pec major. And the pec major should be inserting lateral onto the bone, but it's actually now lying medial to it. For pec major, we also get special sequences that look at um, the whole of the pec major. So these are not just shoulder MRI scans. So if you have a pec major avulsion, you have to get um, special uh, MRI scans to get the images. There's not much to it. You have to cover more of the chest, right? The thorax, and you have to go a little bit lower as well. So you can see the whole length and the, uh, the, of the pec major rather than just the proximal part near the shoulder. And once again, you will see here, if I stop at the right time, you'll see the pec major being torn. And I'll just, you'll see it coming in there. So that is a pec major being torn. Unfortunately, I can't stop it halfway. So surgery is usually indicated for a complete tear. Now this is a complete tear of the sternum or the clavicle head of both. We, of course, there are always options to do it non-op for somebody who has a sedentary lifestyle. Um, and predictably, the patient that is likely to have a pec major tear also benefits from the repair to prevent poor function disability or even cosmesis, i.e. this usually happens in young fit people that do a lot of bodybuilding. And when you don't fix them in that population, they tend to be miserable with it. So with acute repairs, we do a direct repair. In some cases, in chronic tears, just like with triceps, you always try and do an acute repair back on the bone. But just like the triceps, if you can't do it, in chronic cases, you have to have the allograft available to reconstruct it. So lots of different ways of fixing it. Everybody has their own preferred way, but there are some straightforward principles. And the principles are that you have to get the muscle and the tendon and you have to stitch it back onto the bone and you have to fix it as securely as possible so that you can mobilize them early. The guys that rupture their pec majors, just like some of the guys that rupture their triceps, are not the ones who are gonna to listen to you and say, don't do this, don't do that, right? They will lie to you and they'll go back to the gym as soon as possible. Um, and in some ways you have to encourage to do that and try and fix it as securely as possible. So the way I fix it um, is I use what we call buttons. These are um, devices that I'll show you in a second. Um, that are strong and I put them, uh, we tend them switches into the muscles and then we insert these three buttons into the bone. The, tension, the technique that I use is what's called a tension slide technique. And I'll walk you through it. So on the left is a blue little device that is for the delivery of the button. So the button will sit right on the tip of it. And on the right hand side, what you see is a button. Now, usually these are about a centimeter long, so these are obviously magnified here. And this button is what I use to deliver the tendon into the bone. Now, in this video of one of the pec majors that I have repaired, you will see that this patient has both the sternal head and the clavicular head tone. So that is the clavicular head. It is actually lower and more anterior by the time it inserts, and that is the sternal head behind it. Now I have whip stitched it. In this case, the patient did not have much in the way of muscle. Um, so it has been whip stitched throughout with these strong fiber wires to insert. Now what you see at the bottom um, of the picture is the biceps tendon. So that's the biceps tendon running up and down, and the insertion in this case is obviously going to be lateral. Now, people often talk about nerves and so on. Do, what about the pec major nerves? The pec major nerves are really, really medial. 
um, and they're actually fairly safe. Um, quite surprisingly, the main nerve that you can potentially injure, usually temporarily, is the auxiliary nerve. And it's not because it's in the field or anything else, it's just because sometimes you can have fairly enthusiastic retraction on the deltoid. Um, and you just have to be a little bit careful that when you pull on the deltoid, you don't pull too hard to damage the nerve. You've got to remember a lot of these guys have fairly overdeveloped deltoids as well. So in this next picture, um, what I'm showing you is just lateral to the biceps. I've cleared out the periosteum bone and I have done three staggered holds. I also feather dust the bone so it kind of bleeds. And you can see the nice blood coming out of there. And that's the bed for the healing of the tendon. And now I've put the stitches that I've put in the tendon through these buttons. I just want you to see that again. So these are the holes in the bones just where the insertion is supposed to be. The sutures are in the tendons. And what you will see now is also the button with the button delivery device in my hand. Then what I do is I don't worry about the length and so on. I have these sutures in buttons and these three buttons are now in the bone. The one at the top has the clavicular head in it and the two at the bottom has a slightly larger sternal head in it. Now, the technique that we use for actually docking the tendon in is called a tension slide technique. It's not very important unless you're a surgeon to know that. Um, but what's important is from a rehab point of view and so on, is that it allows us to accurately judge how to tension the repair. And you'll see that me doing that right now. So what I've done is the sutures are in, the buttons are in, and I joystick this one suture at a time. And what it does, the sutures now slide through the buttons, which are now in a static position in the bone and I can pull the tendon nice and slowly all the way down to the bone till it's sitting right on the prepared bone. Finally, it's all done. You Now we see this position where the, the deltoid is now sitting there. You can see the repair underneath and we know the repair is strong and anatomical. Um, at that stage, I test the patient by moving the arm to see how much I can externally rotate without putting too much stress on it. And those sort of information is actually quite important for rehabilitation, right? So if I can easily externally rotate the arm to 30 degrees without putting any tension on the repair, I will say that to the rehab specialist so that we don't get the patient that is too stiff. So this is the same chap uh, about six weeks down the line, right? Um, scar heals pretty quickly. You can see the contour and everything is essentially normal. Um, uh, to test the contour, we ask them to we look at the arm so we know the auxiliary fold is intact. Um, and obviously, you know, these guys have to show off. So, you know, slightly earlier than expected, he started doing this. And I was like at a big gasp, but elite athletes heal at a completely different rate to the rest of us normal people. So uh, quickly to go through what else can be done. So there is potential of having these patients present to you in a, in a chronic manner as well. So I have another patient who used to take a lot of anabolic steroids, had a bench, injury, a bench pressing injury three years ago, and he now has a lot of pain every time he contracts his pec major. So you see him, you can see the drop nipple sign on the right-hand side of the patient, i.e. left-hand side of the screen. Uh, you can see that the axillary fold is completely abnormal because he's torn his muscle. And you can see the dip when he contracts his pec major as well. And if, you, if I flip between the two pictures, you can see him contracting the muscle and not having that connection to the bone. So in this case, I still try and get the muscles right back onto the bone. But in this particular case, I was not able to. So in that case, 
Achilles allograft, which we use for Lorton orthopedics for reconstruction. I weave that into the muscle throughout the belly. Then I cut off the excess. So I essentially had the right size of the tendon. And then using the same techniques with the muscle buttons and so on, I do a repair. The rehab for whether it is acute or chronic in my view is pretty much the same. Um, the, it has to be, we, we test what the range is during the, after the surgical repair so that we know how much we need to protect it. So we have a safe zone, as we say, for the physiotherapist. Um, in the first few weeks, there's a lot of closed chain exercises, uh, passive and active assistant range of motion in the safe zones. More importantly, not forcibly stretching out the muscle beyond the safe zone. Uh, pretty soon after that, we do a lot of isometric exercises. Again, go within the, stay within the safe zone. And after six weeks, we then continue on to beyond safe zone uh, to do some more resistance exercises, or more importantly, some sports specific activities. And it's quite important that even for three months or so, we try and avoid certain things like avoiding hyperextension um, when um, doing certain uh, loading exercises like pressing. So with that, I'll call it a day and um, we'll open up the floors to any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ali, that was really nice. Um, I'm just checking whether there are any questions here. Is there any specific position, Ali, when you repair the tendon and you're trying to put the arm in that, you know, you'd, you'd see external rotation, how much would you like to check there on table? So, um, I would like, yeah, so if I can have the arm in approximately 30 degrees of abduction and slightly 30 degrees of external rotation and I can get the repair to that level, I'm pretty happy. Thank you. I think that's it. And uh, well, thank you uh, both the speakers, Roger and Ali. It was an amazing session tonight, uh, telling us about triceps and the pec major. Uh, and thank you to all the participants um, till we meet again in a few weeks' time. Thank thanks you so much, guys. Pleasure. And thanks again, Roger. Uh -huh. Pleasure. Bye now. Questions that I just saw to. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> actually, I have some two questions here, actually, if you don't mind. Is it, are there? Yes. Um, it's one first question is muscle belly repair, muscle belly tears are not repairable. Can, can mesh be used as in other in hernia repairs? Um, no, in my practice, a um, um, lot of times muscle belly repairs don't give the same symptoms of pain or the cosmetic deformities and so on. Um, so we don't tend to repair them. Um, Roger, do you have any, that's certainly for pecs, but from your side, Roger, do you have any um, ideas whether you do muscle belly repairs themselves? More or less the same technique with, uh, with the Achilles tendon. So it's very difficult to, uh, to suture the muscle. And this, guy, this was a guy who was a, a surfer and the, uh, his boat hit him in the, in the back of the triceps. And then this, uh, he had a muscle belly rupture that was initially treated surgically by, uh, by a local surgeon. And then uh, obviously that tore immediately afterwards. And uh, it was not bothered, the, the aesthetics weren't bothering him too much, but it was painful and uh, he was unable to, to perform. So we, uh, we sutured as good as we could. We, we took all the scar tissue out of it, which was quite scary because, because of the nerves. And um, we sutured the muscle belly back together, which obviously didn't hold, but was enough for the surgery. And then I put the, um, the Achilles tendon over it and he, was, he actually recovered very well. In my, in my experience, uh, not for the pec major, but for the biceps, uh, quite commonly for the distal biceps. And on two occasions, for the proximal biceps, where the tendon was completely non-existent and the patient had significant pain, I have used Achilles to actually weave into the muscle and so on to reconstruct the tendon. So the Achilles tendon allograft can be a nice workhouse for selective cases. But 
with every time you use Achilles, you're introducing foreign material, it's effectively a dead tendon till it actually um, has, um, till it actually gets incorporated. So there is a higher risk of infections, etc. cetera. Um, so we just have to be very, very selective when we use Achilles, um, especially around the axilla and the pec majors to make sure it's the right thing to do because the rate of infections can be higher. Uh, there is another question from Arti. Uh, she's asking, doing ultrasound, will that be of any benefit in suspected pec major injuries? Uh, I think clinical diagnosis is the key for pec major injuries. And, 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 from, and, so, and once I have that suspicion, I tend to go for an a, a MRI scan because I can see the pictures myself. Um, it is a lot more accurate with the MRI scans with the pec major sequences to actually see where the tendon is torn, which belly it is, et cetera. There have been some cases where we weren't sure where there was tendon from the bone or muscle tendon. Quite honestly, it doesn't really matter. You'll fix it the same way. Um, we also, in some cases, weren't sure whether it was one head or the other, but I've found that even with the best ultrasound guys, the information was inconclusive in those cases as well. So in my view, uh, for me, it's an X-ray to make sure the bones are fine after a clinical assessment and straight to an MRI scan done properly. Now, likewise, I've also experienced the same thing. Ultrasound never gives a complete answer. Uh, Ali, have you had any experience with using the dermal allografts, you know, what we use for rotator cuff impact major? Uh, no, and I suspect it won't be strong enough. Okay because um, it's good to augment with cuffs and patches and so on, but the tendons, you need a really, really strong tendon uh, for the pec, as well as for any tendon that you're repairing. And Achilles works really well. Well, questions are coming. There's another one now from Daniel Mills. Uh, do you expect to regain full external rotation under tension post pec major repair? Correct, yeah. So sometimes it takes a bit longer, um, but even a tight repair, stretches out. It's just, it's, it's our experience with, um, for example, with uh, biceps at the elbow as well. Sometimes you fix it with slight, uh, you know, you fix it and it's tight and you can't extend it, but invariably all of them get back to their uh, normal length as well. So as long as the rehab happens, the pec will get back to the normal uh, uh, length. Thank you, Ali. I'm just looking whether there's any more from our participants. Um, there isn't, so we can finally say goodbye. Again, perfect. Thanks, guys. Until Thank next time. Thank you very much.